what do we need to know about pulmonary nodules? That's kind of what we're going to cover today. We'll talk about some of the nodule characteristics, radiographic follow-up guidelines, talk a little bit about pathology as well as uh, diagnostic options for it as well. So why do we care? Well, um, I think that as internists, we need to know how to manage the incidentally detected pulmonary nodule. Um, and patients are going to ask. They're going to ask about, you know, what this finding is, and we need to know about lung cancer screening as well, knowing that prevention works and the NLST, the National Lung Screening Trial, um, has shown us that. So I wanted to make this a little bit more interactive than prior presentation, so I thought we'd start off with a quiz, and I'm not going to ask you guys to, um, you know, verbally say what it is at this time. But if you have a piece of paper or use your phone or something and write down what you think the answer is to these questions. So I have seven of them in total. All right, so this first patient has a nodule. Um, it's circled in the, the red there. She's a 56 year old female, a lifetime smoker. She has a right upper lobe subsolid uh, 1.2 centimeter nodule and it was detected on a low dose screening CT. So that is the morphology of it in that right upper lobe. And, um, maybe you guys, based off the morphology, have seen some of these before and just write down what you think it could be. So I'll give you a few seconds on that one. All right. So the second patient is an 88-year-old never smoker. She did have a significant secondhand smoke exposure from her husband. And she is the incidental detection of a 2.8 centimeter right upper lobe solid nodule circled here. What do you think the etiology of that one is? Again, just write it down and we'll come back to it at the end. So the third patient um, is a 52-year-old never smoker, and he presented for a persistent cough, and he was found to have this solid left lower lobe nodule circled there. All right. The fourth patient is a 68-year-old former smoker. He has this incidental detection of a 1.2 centimeter thin-walled right upper lobe cavitary nodule. Um, and this was detected during liver transplant evaluation. And the fifth patient is a 45-year-old never smoker. He has Crohn's disease. He's on Humira, so on a TNF alpha therapy. Um, and he has an incidentally detected left lower lobe solid nodule pointed out right there at the bottom left asymptomatic. All right, two more. Um, this uh, is another former smoker, 72 year old, who presented to medical attention because he had a persistent cough. And he has this large, it's actually not even a nodule when you measure it, a nodule is three centimeters or less. And this is a mass, it's measuring four centimeters in the right upper lobe, solid appearing. And finally, we have um, a two part on this one, 74 year old former smoker who came to medical attention because he could not deal with his persistent cough. It was just driving him crazy. So he has one nodule here in this uh, posterior right upper that's circled in red is solid appearing. You can see he's got some surrounding emphysema. So what is that one, do you guys think? And then he has another one in a little bit more in the anterior right upper lobe, again, circled in red, former smoker, persistent cough. All right, well, hopefully I didn't give away too much about those answers, um, and we'll go through them a little bit later. So first we'll start with talking about some of the radiologic characteristics of nodules and trying to differentiate between them being benign or being malignant. And I'm sure you guys have seen some of this before, but the benign nodules appear to be a little bit more smooth, round, well circumscribed. Um, if they are uh, calcified, which I'll have a um, schematic in a second, 
then you'll see that the calcifications are more central, they're more densely calcified. That would be more consistent with a hematoma or old granulomatous disease. They have popcorn calcifications to it. Again, that could be a hematoma and they might have a laminated appearance. And they're usually smaller, so they're usually less than three centimeters. Um, the malignant nodules are irregular in appearance. They have, if they have calcification, it's off to the side or eccentric. Um, they are spiculated, and I'll show you that in a second, and they're a little bit larger. So not necessarily a nodule, but um, you know, more of a mass. Um, so the calcification patterns of the solitary pulmonary nodule, this is what I mentioned before. Um, they are, if they are clearly benign, um, and these are the diffuse, so um, almost completely calcified central, just a dot kind of look laminated where it's um, uh, multiple different uh, calcification patterns throughout the nodule, um, a little bit more um, elongated in appearance. That's more of a benign appearance to a nodule. It makes you feel better if you see that pattern that it's less likely to be malignant. And if they are a little bit different in appearance where they're stippled, so these small little um, um, calcifications that are kind of scattered throughout the nodule or just one eccentric off to the side calcification, that's gonna make you think that it's more of a malignant pattern and you're gonna be a little bit more concerned about the appearance of it. So um, running through pathology a little bit about these nodules, and I think this is important because um, when we see the appearance, there's a lot of information here, you're not expected to memorize it, but um, when you see the appearance of the nodule on the um, CAT scan, or less likely on the X-ray, but more on the CAT scan, um, and you, you describe the nodule, and we'll talk about ground glass versus subsolid versus solid, um, this is kind of in the back of your mind. Well, based off of the radiologic appearance, this is gonna be what I think the pathologic uh, correlate is gonna be. And for that reason, I do think that we should go with biopsy or not go with biopsy or follow it or, or whatever it is gonna be. So nodules that are pre-malignant are usually this, um, we call it AAH or AIS, which is atypical edematous hyperplasia or adenocarcinoma in situ. And then there's different subsets of that. The malignant nodules are gonna be either minimally invasive adenocarcinomas, they haven't invaded further. There's gonna be an invasive component to it if they are invasive. Um, and then there's gonna be subsets of that. And then there's variants of the um, invasive as well. So this pre-malignant nodule, this atypical edematous hyperplasia, um, is really along the alveolar scepter, and it's the proliferation of mildly to moderately um, atypical pneumocytes, type 2 pneumocytes, and clara cells, which are the normal cells that line the alveolar walls. And you can see that um, this, on a low power, you can see the uh, thickening of the alveolar septa here, and then on a higher power, it's a lot thicker than it really should be. It should be these little thin walled fine structures that you see kind of in the upper left on the image on the left. Um, and so on radiologic appearance, this is what we think of our ground glass nodule. So this is a pure ground glass nodule. You can see through it, you can see normal lung behind it, and it's small. So this may be a pre-malignant nodule, this atypical edematous hyperplasia, adenocarcinoma in situ. And for these reasons, this is why we're gonna uh, follow it and we'll talk about the follow-up in a second. Um, and what if it's adenocarcinoma in situ? So this is a um, uh, malignant, sorry, pre-malignant, um, uh, almost malignant. Um, if it is less than three centimeters, it's gonna be more pre-malignant. And um, we don't see that they've invaded. And we see that um, if they have not invaded and become invasive, they actually have 100% five-year disease-free survival. So these are the nodules that if you do get a diagnosis from it, you're gonna wanna uh, refer them for treatment, you know, be it radiation, be it surgery, you know, whatever the treatment modality of choice is. Um, and these adenocarcinoma in situ can uh, appear, this is a, a good image on the right here, that they're, um, this is more of a solid one. You can see that there's some speculations to it. It's not very um, regular, smooth, round in appearance. Um, and this is the, the pathologic appearance of it on the left. Um, it can be mucinous, it can be non-mucinous subtypes, and these adenocarcinoma in situ don't necessarily need to be solid. You can see um, on the radiologic image um, on the left here that there is a, um, a pure ground glass nature to this one. It's a little bit bigger. Um, you don't see a definitive solid component to it. The solid part that you see here is really a vessel running through it, um, but this is an adenocarcinoma in situ, and again, this is why we want to follow them and um, biopsy or treat them is that 100% five-year disease-free survival. And then there can be other uh, subtypes as well, um, lipidic and um, mucinous as well. 
So the invasive adenocarcinoma, are those that are, have an uh, invasive component that's greater than five millimeters and multiple different subtypes to them that you can um, see here on the right. And if you attend any of our thoracic oncology conferences, the pathologist will go through all of these subtypes as well. Um, if they are invasive, they can be um, mucinous and non-mucinous and mucinous meaning gland forming and gland producing. So you can see on the left here that it almost looks like it could be a pneumonia. It's following the, um, the lobe itself. You can see air bronchograms running through it and it looks like it's just sort of a, a filling process of that lobe. And on the right here on the mucinous one, um, it's a little bit different. You can see air bronchograms running through it, but it appears a little bit more fluffy in appearance. It's not really respecting the borders of the fissures um, and it, it's proliferating there. So um, in these patients that maybe have some uh, pneumonic symptoms and you treat them for pneumonia and you follow up on the imaging and they don't get better, then this is something that should always be in the back of your mind. All right, so how are we gonna manage these uh, incidentally detected nodules? Well, there are guidelines for this. This is from the uh, Fleischner Society, which is a radiographic society. Um, and they've created multiple iterations of their guidelines to manage these incidentally detected nodules. And what I wanna make sure you guys know is that these are not for nodules for in the young. The nodules that are picked up in the young are usually inflammatory, infectious. It's much less likely to be malignant. They're not for the immunocompromised. They're not for that because um, you're worried about infection in those um, that are immunocompromised. You're worried about um, uh, possibly an inflammatory process and a little bit less likely to, um, not always less likely to be malignant, but um, it's something that you're gonna wanna follow a little bit more closely. And it's not for those that have a known malignancy. So it's really for the incidentally detected nodules um, for people that are outside of those three criteria. And how do we manage them? Well, there's multiple different um, guidelines I'll show you in a sec, but um, we do want to risk stratify these patients. And you're gonna see this on the tables here, where low risk is less than 5% risk of being malignant and high risk is greater than 65%. And this risk um, is based upon the um, American College of Chest Physicians guidelines, which we'll go through. So how did this Fleischner Society, this radiographic society decide upon um, uh, these guidelines? Well, um, they've looked at you know, multiple different um, uh, CTs, and there have been studies and, um, that have uh, kind of uh, correlated with these guidelines. So they measure it by the average of the long and the short axis diameters, and they find that this is the better prediction estimate of malignancy and a better estimate um, of the known tumor volume. Um, and we looked at the morphology of it, and that being that if it's solid, it's present on the mediastinal windows. It doesn't disappear when you go from mediastinal to, ground, uh, to um, lung windows, excuse me. It's ground glass if you can see through it on the lung windows and it's invisible on the mediastinal windows. It's subsolid if it's partially invisible on the mediastinal windows. And then um, we're really concerned if it's speculated and because of that, you're gonna increase the risk of malignancy up to um, over twofold. So what are the um, uh, kind of characteristics of these nodules that uh, make us concerned? Again, the upper lobe, um, right upper lobe in particular location, if they're peripheral, um, if they, we think it's more of an adenocarcinoma, if it's hyalur, we think it's more of a squamous cell carcinoma, or could be a small cell as well. And then um, we do worry about growth rates. So we want to look at, um, we're following them over time. Um, if there is a 26% uh, increase in diameter, that core on, on the CT, on the radiograph, um, that corresponds to one doubling time. And we know that um, the doubling time of malignant solid nodules is about 400 days, so a little over a year. And the subsolid nodules grow long, much slower, and this is why the follow-up can be a little bit longer. If we see emphysema from the Fleischner Society guidelines, we know that this is an independent risk factor for malignancy. Um, and then so is um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So you may, gonna, you may want to follow these patients um, a little bit uh, closer. In fact, IPF is more of a risk factor um, than emphysema alone. And so this is a, a schematic looking at the volume doubling time. This is what we look at on the CTs. We're looking to see how quickly they enlarge. And if it's um, pretty fast, so a doubling time of less than 20 days, we think it's more infectious or inflammatory. Um, uh, malignant nodules don't really grow that quickly. If it's over 400 days, we think that it's more of a benign pattern. And if it's in between, we're a little bit more worried for for malignancy. Um, females actually have a higher risk of it being malignant. Um, if you are detecting it um, on um, a CT, especially with the ground glass nodules, and then family history as well um, is going to increase your risk of um, a family history of lung cancer, I should say. 
is going to increase your risk of a nodule being um, malignant. So taken together, these are the guidelines, and they're guidelines for solid nodules, which I'm showing here. Um, and then this is the low risk versus high risk off to the left. And um, the low versus the high risk, like I said, is based off of those uh, ACCP, the College of Chest Physicians guidelines, where we're talking about nodule characteristics, location, upper lobe location, smoking history, family history, um, previous history of cancer as well. And then we look at the size and the size on the top here kind of determines um, based off of the size and the risk is what the follow-up is gonna be. So if you have a high risk patient that's found to have an incidentally detected uh, seven millimeter nodule, then say um, risk, the risk factors that they were a uh, former smoker, then you're probably going to want to follow up with the CT at the intervals mentioned here. And if you have a high risk uh, patient that is found to have a uh, lung nodule that say is 2.3 meter, then follow, they're going to fall into the category here. And then you're going to talk about whether or not we're going to do a PET or tissue sampling. And we'll talk about that in a second. So, um, these do not need to be memorized by any means. Um, I think even pulmonologists look them up and they do change um, with different iterations of the guidelines. There are guidelines for subsolid nodules as well. Um, and the subsolid being um, that there is uh, some degree of a solid component to it. Um, and the reason that we are worried about that is that the, there is um, a higher risk actually for part solid nodules for those subsolid nodules to be malignant uh, in comparison to the ground glass nodule. And so we really do are worried about those and follow them quite closely. Um, so some um, kind of uh, schem uh, not schematic, but uh, pictures here, I should say, of why we care about these nodules. So on the left here, you can see that there was a ground glass nodule. Uh, you can see completely through it. Um, it just kind of looks like there's shattered glass um, in appearance on the CT. It's being followed and it gets maybe a little bit more um, um, uh, succinct or distinct, I should say. Um, and then over time, you can see that it's starting to develop a solid component. And the solid component is this uh, darker white area in the center there. So it's really progressed from being a ground glass nodule to being a subsolid nodule. So we're worried that there may actually be um, the beginning of an invasive component to it. And when this patient did go for surgery, they were um, a very early stage, a stage 1A, um, which is the earliest we have of a lung cancer diagnosis of an invasive adenocarcinoma. And so this is the reason we follow these nodules because over time they may change and they may start to become an invasive cancer which can be surgically resected and cured. So here's another appearance here of a CT where on the left it was a subsolid nodule to begin with. So there's some ground glass around it. There's a solid component in the center and over time progresses to have a much larger solid component. So again, um, this is uh, the beginning of a malignant um, process and can be resected and can be removed. And that being said, and it doesn't necessarily mean that if you have a, a subsolid nodule, which is on the appearance on the right here to begin with, and you follow it, that it can't regress and it can't be an inflammatory or infectious component. So again, reason to follow these nodules. One last appearance here where you wouldn't think much of this very peripheral ground glass appearance initially, but over time it really develops to have a solid component and then, uh, sorry, a solid component to a subsolid nodule and then a very spiculated solid appearance. So again, this is why we follow these. Okay, so I did mention the ACCP guidelines regarding um, the um, stratification of risk. So high risk is those patients that are older, that have a heavy smoking uh, history, um, that have a larger size nodule with irregular margins and a spiculated upper lobe location. Those folks are gonna have, if you uh, find a nodule, six, greater than 65% risk of that nodule being malignant. In stark contrast, a nodule um, is going to be um, deemed to be uh, less than 5% risk of cancer in the low risk patients. And those are those that are, have a young age, less smoking, smaller size, a non upper lobe location and regular margins. Um, so hopefully that will help with deciding some of the uh, answers to our previous questions. So how do we work through some of these lung nodules? Well, there are um, uh, different schematics and different societal recommendations for it. And this is just one, this is the American College of Chest Physicians. Um, and if you find a, a solid nodule um, that is between eight millimeters and 30 millimeters, so that it is still a nodule, and the eight millimeters being that the ACCP uses that as the cutoff of anything that should be followed. 
then you assess their risk um, of surgery. Are they high risk or are they low to moderate risk of having surgery? And then you, if you think they're low to moderate risk, um, then you go down the, um, the schematic here. Well, um, do we think that they are very low risk of malignancy based off of the things that I just mentioned? Do we think they're high risk of this being malignant or are they low to moderate? And the vast majority of people are gonna really have a low to moderate risk of this nodule um, being um, malignant. And this is where PET really falls into the, um, uh, the use here. Because if they're low to moderate risk, um, then if it's not active on the PET scan, then you may be able to follow them with CT surveillance. And if it is um, very active on the PET scan, then you may be talking about doing a biopsy or just sending them straight to surgery based off the appearance on the PET. So like I mentioned, there are ACCP and there are Fleischner Society guidelines. They differ a tiny bit. You don't necessarily need to know the differences, but the guidelines are out there and they can be easily looked up. I will say that um, there are some differences between them. The Fleischner Society starts at wanting to follow nodules that are greater than six millimeters. Um, the ACCP is eight millimeters. There's difference in the ground glass appearance as well as the, um, the guidelines as well, but you don't need to know, um, you know too much about this. So, what about in the future? So there is um, a, a push to kind of change from measuring the nodules on CTs from um, a diameter where you're measuring the short axis and the long axis to measuring it in a volumetric approach and um, getting a better sense of what that uh, nodule is looking like. And I think that in the next guidelines that may be forthcoming. And there actually are models that can help us predict malignancy. So taking all these into account, you can actually, the factors that I talked about, um, you can look up um, models on the, um, you know, on UpToDate and on, um, you can Google for it too. But um, there have been models that have been validated based off of x-ray and then off of CT. So the Mayo model is the one that we really used for incidentally detected lung nodules. And yes, it was kind of founded on x-ray and it's been extrapolated into CT, but it'll give you what we think is the um, risk factor of that, sorry, the likelihood of that nodule that you found being malignant based off of the risk factors um, of the um, patient and of the characteristics of the nodule itself. So it's kind of worth looking up when you have a um, nodule that's incidentally found on a um, CT in the future. So we'll talk a second here about screening detected lung nodules. So the NLSD, the National Lung Screening Trial, was a uh, pretty landmark study that was uh, done in 2000, uh, prior, prior to 2011, but published in 2011 in the um, New England Journal. And they looked at 53,000 people, men and women aged 55 to 74, who were current or former heavy smokers. And it was done across the US. Each participant was randomly assigned to receive screenings with a low dose CT or a standard X-ray once a year for three years. Um, and they found that about a quarter of all CT scans had an abnormality to it with the, the vast majority, 96% of those being false positives. But taken together, um, all together, and these are the, the numbers to remember here, is that the trial demonstrated that there are 20% fewer lung cancer deaths among all participants that were screened. So 20% um, less people are going to um, pass away from lung cancer if you're able to screen them. I think that that's pretty landmark so that the number needed to screen to prevent one cancer death uh, was one person in 320, which is not much. Um, so if you look at the uh, survival curves, the Kaplan-Meier curves here, looking at low-dose CT in terms of chest X-ray, um, they found that the low-dose CT was actually a lot more um, beneficial. So they picked up more lung cancers and there was um, a higher risk of death from lung cancer if you were screening with x-ray is in comparison to CT. And so this is really where our CT screening started to come from. So much so that the U US Preventative Services Health Task Force uh, started recommending um, that there is an annual screening, a low-dose CT for lung cancer. It originally started at ages 55 to 80. It was covered by Medicare uh, recommendations for 55 to 77, those that had a 30 pack year smoking history and were a current or former smoker that quit within the past 15 years. So if anyone has been following the news, you know that this has actually recently changed in the past month or two. The updated 2021 guidelines are 50 to 80 years and a lower 
um, pack year smoking history. So we're decreasing it from 30 pack years to 20 pack years, trying to catch more people that have had a little bit of a less smoking history. They do still have to meet the criteria of that they're currently smoking or they quit within the past 15 years. So we're making the uh, minimum age go from 55 to 50, and we're making the um, pack years go from 30 to 20. Again, um, this is the most recent uh, iteration of the uh, updated guidelines, which are um, actually have been approved and are supposed to go into effect January 1 of 2022. So we did talk about that there were models that you can um, look up and um, that have been performed to kind of determine the risk of malignancy for a nodule in the incidentally detected. Well, in the lung cancer screening, it's a little bit of a different model. It's the Brock University model is what you're going to, um, you know, see it called here. Um, and this is taking data from the NLST and extrapolating it to what would be from a lung cancer screening detected nodule. Again, you're going to see that the, um, the risks are the same age, female sex, a history of lung cancer, family, emphysema, size of the nodule, so if it's solid, partially solid, um, or ground glass, and then the location of it as well as the presence of speculations. So taken together, this is um, what we uh, use as well to determine if there is a lower or high risk of a nodule on a lung cancer screening being malignant. So if you do speak with patients and they're a little bit hesitant uh, to get this uh, CT, I think that you can uh, kind of uh, assuage some of their fears if you talk about low-dose CT and the radiation risk from it. So it is five times less risk of radiation or less amount of radiation, I should say, excuse me, than a conventional chest CT. So it's equivalent to about 50 cross-country flights. There's background radiation in the environment as well. It's about six months of background radiation or 15 chest x-rays. But the thing that if you really um, let people know that it is a loss, lot less radiation than a conventional chest CT, um, they are a little bit more likely to get screened. Um, what about the cost associated with lung cancer screening? So the cost to screen per person, and this is um, uh, based off of a couple studies, is about $1,600 per person. But if you then put that cost into quality adjusted life years, how much time are we going to gain um, from them in, in kind of a, a cost perspective? Um, you can see that um, the cost per quality adjusted life year gained for one annual low-dose CT is about $52,000. But if you compare this to colon cancer screening or to breast cancer screening, which are you know, readily accepted and, and readily um, um, accepted in the population, then you can see that it's, it's kind of on par with colonoscopy. So if you get a colonoscopy every 10 years, um, it's kind of equivalent to the um, quality adjusted life years and the um, amount of um, return from that as it is for a one year annual low dose screening CT. So I think that it really does show that it is a um, accepted um, screening modality. All right, so you detected a lung cancer, uh, a lung nodule and a lung cancer screening CT and you want to know, well, what am I supposed to do with this? Well, of course, you know, similar to the Fleischner Society guidelines, we have guidelines for this. Um, these are based off of the um, American College of Radiology, and it's called lung RADS. Similar if you think about breast radiation, sorry, breast um, um, uh, follow-up guidelines, they'll give it a bi rad score. So this is a lung RAD score. Um, and we define growth of a nodule as greater uh, increase of uh, 1.5 um, or more millimeters. So again, this is something you can look up, but if you send your patient for a low dose lung cancer screening CT, you're gonna see that they're gonna give them a score, a lung rad score. Um, and then you can, based off of that score, determine when the follow-up is gonna be. So if they are lung rads two, then you're gonna, it's less likely to be malignant. It's um, a new nodule that's less than four millimeters or a nodule less than six millimeters, then you're gonna continue on an annual low-dose screening. If you have a lung rad score of 4B, that's gonna be a nodule that's greater than or equal to 15 millimeters or new or growing, um, then you're gonna really want to have a dedicated chest CT or a PET, um, or you're going to want to refer them for a biopsy. So again, these scores are noted on the reports that you're seeing from the radiologist for the 
uh, low dose lung cancer screening and they'll often put in there what the follow up is uh, based off of the lung rad score. But um, these are some of the um, um, uh, diagrams of what they uh, are recommended. And so there is a part solid nodule and then there's also a non solid nodule as well. Um, so what if we look at these lung rads criteria and we retrospectively apply it to the CTs that we found in the NLST in the National Lung Screening Trial? And we'll actually see that um, the um, positive nodule size can actually increase a little bit. Um, and with that, then you're going to decrease the amount of false positives that you're going to get. Um, you are going to decrease the sensitivity a little bit, but you're not going to have as many false positives and you're not going to send as many people for a biopsy, which, you know, is a good thing. All right, so you found a nodule on a, a CT and what are we going to do next? Well, we talk about PET scan here for a second. So both societies, be it the Fleischer Society and the um, American College of Chest Physicians, are gonna to advocate to use PET scan if the nodules are greater than eight millimeters. And if they're greater than eight millimeters, they're more likely to be able to show up on PET. If they're less than eight millimeters, there's not a whole lot of utility. You're not gonna really get any activity on a PET scan. So the ACCP recommends doing this for the intermediate, intermediate probability patients or for pre-surgical planning. So if you think back to the risk factors I mentioned, less than 5% risk of malignancy. Um, you don't really need to do anything besides follow. If they're eight, greater than 65% chance of malignancy, you're gonna go ahead and send them for uh, something more invasive. And it's really those people in the middle um, that you're gonna to wanna to use the PET for. Um, and that really ends up being a, quite a, a lot of people and a, somewhat of the vast majority. Um, so if you do a PET and it's positive, or if you're sending them straight for a diagnostic procedure, then we're going to start talking about biopsy. So there are different options for a biopsy. There's the CT guided biopsy, CT guided transthoracic needle aspiration, um, which can be done by uh, radiology and uh, some pulmonologists as well. Um, so the diagnostic yield for it is quite good. It's increased based off of the nodule size, the, how far it is to the pleura, how close it is to the pleura, to the visceral pleura. Um, the needle size, the number of needle passes, and the presence of on-site cytopathology are going to increase the um, likelihood that you're going to get a positive result from a CT-guided biopsy. Um, they're not as good for the pure ground glass nodules. They're much better for the solid nodules. Um, and based off of the needle size, you're going to get um, a, a somewhat of a better result. So if the nodules are, are pretty small, they're pure ground glass, they're less than a centimeter, then the diagnostic yield can be as low as 35%. Um, but um, it is a option of what you can do for diagnosing um, lung nodules. So what about bronchoscopic biopsy? Well, that's what I you know, spent a lot of my time doing. So there are different ways that we can um, biopsy the, no the nodules via bronchoscopy. One of them is radial EBIS, and this is a um, endobronchial ultrasound. It's very small. The um, distal tip is a little over a centimeter or so. You can see it in the middle of the screen here, and I'll explain this to you. But what it is, is um, it's going to give you a 360 degree representation of the lung at that part where you're inserting the radial ultrasound. And it's going to let you go down to five centimeters of lung penetration. And on the images on the right here, you're going to see that if you're in the center of a nodule, this is the appearance you're going to get. We call it a concentric view. So that the, sh the radial ultrasound is in the very center. That's the bright white in the center. And the nodule itself is surrounding it. This is the abnormality that you're looking at. This is normal lung behind it, which is the darker black. If you're off to the side of a nodule, so that this is your ultrasound there and the nodule is off to the side of your ultrasound, then you can see the appearance there, normal lungs surrounding it. We call that an eccentric view. And we can use this to localize where the nodules are so that we are able to get a X-ray guidance knowing that we're in the area and confirmation with a radial ultrasound as well. And when you get this concentric view here on the left, with the probe being right in the middle of the lesion, the um, increase of a, a diagnosis increases by about eight times. So what about um, using radial endobronchial ultrasound versus CT guided? 
well, this actually has been studied. Um, and you are going to, um, without going through all the data here, which you can review, um, the diagnosis can be quite, the diagnosis rate can be quite similar. Um, and the only thing you're going to kind of sacrifice is a little bit of an increased risk of a pneumothorax when you're doing CT guided biopsy. Um, so what about electromagnetic navigation? You guys probably hear us mention this as well. So this is a modality where we are creating an electric uh, magnetic field around the patient. Um, and it's actually allowing us to localize where that nodule is. And then we confirm it with, uh, all, um, with radial endobronchial ultrasound and we confirm it also with fluoroscopy or we can use CT confirmation as well. So this is an old um, schematic here of what the super dimension, which is one of the electromagnetic systems that are on the market. There are multiple other ones. This is what it looked like. So that you have a um, locator guide, which is a, has an electromagnetic sensor on the end of it, and you're driving it down into the airways um, based off of what the machine is telling you where to go. And you're lining up the nodule and the axial view on the CT here, the coronal view and the sagittal view and then you're confirming it with the ultrasound and with the fluoroscopy. And we found that the diagnostic rate of increase with navigation, you're increasing the diagnostic rate to over about 70%. So another tool to get out to these nodules that are um, you know, further out in the periphery and maybe too central in the lung um, for a CT guided biopsy and the risks associated with it. So what if we combine all these tools? We use electromagnetic navigation, we use radial endobronchial ultrasound, um, and we do it all together. Um, there actually is going to increase your yield. And if you don't have visualization with the radial ultrasound to confirm your view, then you're um, a little bit less likely to get a diagnosis from it. Um, that said, um, there is a, um, a, a large meta-analysis that was looking at all of this combined together, and there was a diagnostic yield using all these modalities of greater than about 70%. So you'll hear us talk most recently about robotic bronchoscopy, and this is uh, kind of exciting because it allows us to get out to those peripheral small nodules um, to have an increased ability um, to visualize them out to the periphery and to be able to localize them. And there are two robots on the market here, um, one on the left and then one on the right. The one on the right looks like um, a, um, uses a control that looks like uh, with um, video games, basically, and the one on the left is a little bit different here. So I think that I have a video here, hopefully it works to show you guys. Um, this is our bronchoscopy suite and this is the robot that we use. Um, this is the robot arm over here. This is the controller where we're able to drive down into the distal airways and the screen here where we look at the um, tree of the uh, lungs and the airways and we have a video image from the, um, the airway and then a, a representation um, a reconstructed uh, image of where the nodule is based off of a CT scan. And hopefully the video will work. Oh no, it may not, let me try. No, it didn't, I'm sorry. So um, if anyone wants to spend time with us in the bronchoscopy suite, you're more than welcome. We do lots of these robotic bronchoscopies. You can see us drive out to all the peripheral nodules and um, how we are able to then visualize them with radial ultrasound and to biopsy them as well. So it's quite an exciting tool and it's really increasing our diagnostic yield where I said that about 70% diagnostic yield on average from the other bronchoscopic combination modalities, this is gonna be an increased yield greater than 70% as well. So a very exciting tool for that. All right, well, I'm gonna to return to the cases here. And if anyone um, remembers them from the beginning, feel free to unmute yourself and shout out what you think the answer might be. Um, so the first case was this lifetime smoker. She had a right upper lobe, 1.2 centimeter uh, solid nodule. It was found on a low dose screening CT. Does anyone want to hazard a guess what that is? Is it adeno? Okay. Why do you think that? Um, it looks like the ones you showed us from earlier. It's upper lobe. She's a smoker. Um, it's, I, I, I don't know if I'd call this peripheral, but it doesn't seem like Hyler. So I don't know. That was my guess. Yeah, yeah, you're correct. Absolutely correct. So um, if I showed you other cuts, you would see that it actually does have a little bit more of a subsolid appearance. The cut I gave you is a little bit solid. And if you look behind it, see that little kind of line right behind it? 
it looks to be a little bit more like there's some atelectasis. We call this linear atelectasis behind it. So it makes you think that maybe there is something um, in more in those um, airways that's causing it to occlude and causing atelectasis behind it. But you are correct. She had this resected. It was a uh, stage 1A2 um, based off of the size. Um, she had no invasion of any of the lymphovascular structures. She had no lymph nodes. So she is surgically cured at this time. She'll get surveillance um, CTs afterwards for follow-up, but she needs no adjuvant therapy afterwards. So great. And this is why we're doing our lung cancer screening CTs. We're trying to pick up nodules like this to send people for um, cure. All right, lung adenocarcinoma. Second nodule. 88-year-old, never smoker, significant secondhand smoke exposure, 2.8 centimeters, incidentally detected during workup for something else, right upper lobe, solid. What do you guys think? Maybe squamous? Okay. Um, sure. So, um, it is actually adenocarcinoma. Um, so it is a uh, pretty, uh, I think that that's a, a reasonable um, thought process based off of the size of it. Um, it is actually um, very apical and very peripheral. It certainly could be squamous as well. Um, and the size of it is actually on serial imaging has grown, but it actually did start off being more of a subsolid nodule and grew over time. There was some a little bit lost to follow up, but um, it was um, actually a lung adenocarcinoma. And she is going to go for uh, definitive radiation as she does not want surgery. Okay, what about this guy? 52 year old, never smoker, had a pretty significant persistent cough and you have got a left lower lobe nodule. How would you guys describe it? Do you, it's solid, but do you think that it's speculated? It seems pretty circumferential. Like I don't see mm -hmm. a lot of speculations coming off it. Um, it looks hopefully benign in appearance. Okay, yeah, that was my hope as well. Let me give you one more cut here. So I hid this initially, but that's the upper lobe, the upper lobes. What do you guys think of that? So a little bit more likely to be metastatic disease. Unfortunately, you've got bilateral nodules here, varying sizes, kind of ill-defined borders to both of them, not very well circumscribed like the one in the left lower lobe. And the thing, I didn't give you the mediastinal cut here, but at the anterior mediastinum, there's actually a mass there. And one of the differentials for an anterior mediastinal mass is lymphoma. And so this is actually Hodgkin's lymphoma. So lung nodules don't have to be lung cancer. They can be other types of cancer as well. Um, and the diagnosis for this was actually obtained by a supraclavicular lymph node that was enlarged. All right, about this one. Former smoker, right upper lobe, thin walled, cavitary lesion, little over a centimeter, detected during lung liver transplant evaluation. Asymptomatic. So it does have a little bit of an odd appearance to it. The fact that it's cavitary um, makes you concerned that could this be an infectious process? Um, he was not immunosuppressed prior to this, but he is a smoker. You can get cavitary lung cancer. Some of the cavitary lung cancers are more likely to be squamous. They don't have to be. You can get a cavitary adenocarcinoma as well. Um, I will tell you that uh, we did do a biopsy. We didn't get a definitive from a, a biopsy from it, from a bronchoscopic biopsy. The lymph nodes in the middle of the chest were negative, so we didn't see any evidence of spread. And he actually went for resection. And on resection, meaning surgical resection, we found that it was actually MAI, so Mycobacterium avium intracellulare. Um, this was resected. He had no additional nodules, and for that reason, he needed no additional um, antibiotic therapy, and he was um, cured. So just because you have risk factors doesn't necessarily mean that a nodule is malignant, and that was kind of what I wanted to, to show you guys, but clearly it needed to be evaluated. You know, the appearance, the radiographic appearance and his risk, risk factors were uh, very concerning. So good outcome for him. All right. 
what about this left lower lobe, ill-defined solid nodule incidentally found in a guy who is um, immunosuppressed? I think we have to at least think about TB in someone like this. Okay, yeah, absolutely. You're correct. Um, so prior to going on to the TNF alpha therapy, he was tested for TB and it was negative. Um, he has no risk factors in the meantime, but clearly is immunosuppressed. And he was um, tested for TB again with um, at least a, a um, interferon gamma release assay that was again negative. Um, and he did have a PET scan performed because this is kind of a intermediate probability, right? I, we, he's not low risk, he's not high risk, and it was active on the PET scan. So we did a biopsy on that and it came back as no evidence of malignancy, but again, we're still a little bit concerned. He wanted a definitive diagnosis and he went for surgery. And on surgery, on resection, it was found to be organizing pneumonia. So it's interesting. So organizing pneumonia is an inflammatory condition that can be related to some of the TNF alpha drugs and it can have any sort of appearance. And this appears to be a nodule for all intensive purposes. Um, and fortunately, it was non-malignant for him. So his Humira was discontinued. He was started on a different agent for his Crohn's disease, and he has had no additional lung nodules pop up. All right, this one's quite concerning, right? It's an upper lobe, four centimeter, former smoker who shows a stink cough. This nodule significantly pet avid, pet being ordered before he um, you know, saw us. And um, if he had come to pulmonary attention, we may have just first jumped a biopsy because we're so concerned about the appearance. You want to hazard a guess? Anyone? Some sort of non-small cell here. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought it was going to be too. Um, I was very concerned that it was going to be um, a non-small cell lung cancer. We did a robotic bronchoscopy on him. You can see, or it's a little difficult to appreciate, but there are some good airways going into it. And we put a needle into it and we were aspirating and we got out pus. So this gentleman had a near complete resolution of a lung abscess that was biopsied via the robot and um, found to be um, infection. It's located in the posterior segment of the right upper lobe, but you know, he didn't recall any aspiration. You can aspirate into the posterior subsegment. Um, but um, he felt a lot of fatigue, and once he was started on antibiotics, it resolved. So this was, uh, I just saw him again in the clinic yesterday. This was a uh, really, um, had everyone fooled. Oncology, us, his primary, we all thought this was gonna be malignant, and it was a, the beginning of a lung abscess. So good for him. All right, what about the two-part one? This first nodule, um, this is the, the appearance of it initially, and then there's a follow-up scan. Um, this was done about three months later. So it looks like it's getting smaller. Um, it uh, was probably an inflammatory nodule. So just because he's a smoker with significant, a former smoker with significant emphysema and it's an upper lobe and it's got a speculated appearance, doesn't always mean it's malignant. Um, so, you know, we can be fooled but then he has another nodule. So this was either inflammatory or infectious, but then he had that anterior nodule. So this was prior. And then this is the follow-up three months later. What do you think about that? Is that concerning for small cell maybe? Yeah, so I think that's a, a very good concern. You're correct. It's um, central. Um, small cell tends, um, not always, but can tend to grow a little bit more rapidly. Um, we have absolutely picked up um, small cell cancers in the very earliest stage. So I think that's, you know, definitely a, a consideration. On biopsy, it ended up being a squamous cell carcinoma, actually. Um, so this was uh, radiated because he's got a lot of uh, emphysema and he wasn't a surgical candidate. But then he pops up with this other nodule at the follow-up. So that nodule was actually, we're going to follow it for now. It, you know, it's still pretty small. And he, we've seen that there's been demonstration of other inflammatory nodules. So he may just have some inflammatory, um, you know, component to some of these nodules, but clearly it's going to have to be followed because now he's had one lung cancer and he's at risk for having more lung cancers as well. So this was a little bit of a, a tricky one. So squamous cell carcinoma and don't know what the next thing is. 
All right. Well, hopefully I've shown to you guys that um, lung nodule detection is going to increase as lung cancer screening changes and it's, you know, more um, proliferates into uh, your practice. Um, it's important to know the management options for lung nodules. Um, we need to know about the diagnostic capabilities of bronchoscopic biopsy and then um, uh, all of the support that we can use for them. And then robotic bronchoscopy is another kind of um, exciting addition to our abilities um, to do diagnosis and likely therapeutics coming down the pipeline, but more to come for that in the future.